But he also had a very good sense of, of humor. And we had to, to really listen carefully to understand that he would be uh, you know, making a joke. And uh, sometimes I made a mistake and did something. I uh, didn't do what he asked me to do by a patient. And um, he smiles and he says, uh, don't you feel guilty? Uh, don't you feel guilty? Uh, so I realized that he wanted to do something that I was done out of town and uh, I didn't do that. He had energy that he would fly from Plata to Libya somewhere and he would land in Atlanta and he would rent a car from there and drive the whole night and come in, in the morning 7.30 he would operate on a person. And then the rest of the day he would work or go to the clinic and the next night he was in the consumer car. This is the kind of energy that he had here at And um, the hostility around us was, uh, this was like when he worked in, in Zuri, one surgeon had called the surgeon in here, a chief surgeon, uh, one of the senior person. They be careful of this man when he comes into the time of the city. Because uh, he could take over your practice and he could uh, cause a lot of damage to your, uh, your situation there. So make sure that he doesn't uh, get, get privileged. Keep a very close eye on him. So one of the procedures that he was doing was uh, height of hundreds. And those uh, operations. He did about 20 operations in a couple of years while people did not understand, the surgeon here did not understand that this was a, 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 a very effective method of, of treating the people. Uh, he was ahead, 30 years ahead of him. So 10 years later, one of the groups who prevented him from doing the surgery they presented their cases more than 100 or 120 cases. And they uh, blamed him for doing 20 cases in two years. So this is how they were uh, hostile and uh, um, uh, trying to hurt him. In the gastric bypass operation that he did, there was a the time that he was the one who introduced this procedure that this uh, help people prevent their, their uh, are treated, their, cure their blood pressure, their, their diabetes, their lung problems, and other problems. And this local surgeon, they didn't understand the concept. Now they know it, the whole country knows, the whole world knows it, that there is deep treatment for uh, all those medical uh, problems. You treat the market obesity and all those problems that we saw. And he had to vision this long before people could understand it. So I could go on and on and on to tell you about the things that he did that most people didn't understand. But we just lost the opportunity to really cooperate with him with all those meetings that our brother Akuni mentioned, that we had all those meetings. And uh, so we really didn't follow what he wanted us to do. And, uh, Somehow I didn't think that, you know, we betrayed him. And I feel guilty that uh, we didn't do the, the kind of thing that he wanted us to do. And I ask Allah's forgiveness for uh, that, uh, um, he would forgive us for the uh, misunderstanding we had or the uh, shortcomings that we had. And thank you. And now, uh, one of the best uh, persons to talk about Dr. Ahmad Khadi and the closest to him is Sister Majda. His, his daughter, my sister. And uh, we have also her husband, uh, Dr. Vlad Saleh. Stand up for people to know you. And we have also Brother Tarek. Please stand up. He's uh, the husband of Samira. The, Oh, is she the fourth daughter? She's not in the fourth. Oh, she's with us too.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. There's not much left for us to say after everybody spoke. MashaAllah, um, I think they saw what we saw. I'm going to just focus on uh, after he died, Rahmatullahi. And I went back to work at the Islamic school in Tampa. And students who, there's no way they could have known him, 10, 12 years old, they would come and they'd uh, say, Allah, Allah, he was a great man. And they pat me on the shoulder and they walk by. And I don't know where they heard that he was a great man, except maybe in the khutbah or uh, after the funeral. So a few days later, I decided that that would be my topic to speak to them about at the assembly. And I asked them what made him a great man. Um, a lot of times when you talk about great men, they talk about the legacy like you have today, it's about institutions they built, or huge amounts of money they amassed, uh, or countries they led. But I told them what made him great was his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think like Hussam said, it's very insulting to say that because we all assume we have a belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I don't think we have his belief. I think very few people even among us in this room, have the belief that he had. It wasn't just to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. It was truly to believe that even if we didn't see it, and every problem could be solved by just placing our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I know when we started the first Islamic school in Tampa, people told us there's no way. There aren't even 30 kids in the community who will trust you with their kids. There wasn't the money, there wasn't the facilities. And so I called him and I said, uh, give me advice, what can we do? We called Isna and we asked them, how do we start an Islamic school? And they said, you know what, we're not sure, but when you find out, please call us and let us know. <laughs> I said, good. Isna's not my answer. So I called him and basically he said, say Bismillah, put one foot in front of the other and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of the rest. And that I think is truly what uh, made him great. And those of us, I think, that learn from him have to have that belief to say that we're following in his footsteps. Because it's not so much what we do, it's the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our partner in everything we're doing. And nothing is so difficult that we cannot uh, overcome it. And I know a lot of us uh, have faced a lot of problems, and people look at me and they say, why are you not, how do you not get angry when you have these problems? How do you keep smiling? How is it that you're happy? And I tell them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. And that's, that was his belief, regardless of what he went through. And he never saw the bad in people. Dr. Isaac Ahmed mentioned that maybe they betrayed him. Or maybe they went against what he thought should happen. He never looked at anybody as having betrayed him. He always had faith that they were doing the best that they could do. And maybe they didn't understand exactly what he wanted. But he never got angry with anybody. And I think uh, we would get angry for him. And he would tell us, only 10% of the people can understand what I'm saying. The other 90% may never understand. But we have to do what we do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the rest doesn't matter. And a lot of people would be angered even by his attitude. How does he not get angry? Why is he so forgiving? How does he let people do what they do? And it didn't matter to him. And subhanAllah, when I went back to school the Monday after his funeral, a lot of um, students and staff, they were upset with me. How could she come back to school? She should be mourning uh, the death of her father. And subhanAllah, until this day, I cannot mourn his loss because he's so much more fortunate than we are. emails literally from every country in the world. I don't think there was a country that we did not get an email from or a phone call from, whether it was Pakistan or Malaysia or Germany, uh, Italy, uh, everywhere in Africa. They would tell us that when they announced his passing, everyone in the masjid was making dua for him. I got a call from the education forum, one of the conferences in uh, Chicago, and they had about 500